Hi, my name is Anthony Cagini. I'm the director of the National Energy Technology Laboratory. In celebration of National Lab Day, science and engineers from our laboratory will demonstrate several fun and educational science experiments. You'll make slime to learn about polymers and a process called polymerization. You'll learn how crystals from form by making crystal flowers from coal. You'll explore chemical tests of common materials. And you'll learn about energy and put it to work launching bottle rockets. Most of all, I hope that you'll learn the science and technology are fun. In a laboratory, you can explore the same chemical reactions and energy that drive the universe. You can study the matter that we, your pets, and the stars are made of. I hope you'll have a great time today, and I hope that you'll consider becoming a scientist, engineer, or a mathematician in the future. There are so many questions that only they will be able to help answer. Can we totally prevent colds, flu, allergies? What can we do to extend the average lifespan of people, give good health to everyone, people to live more than 100 years? How do we improve the quality of life of all the 6.5 billion people who live on planet Earth? Some of those things are beyond our reach now, but in the future, we might be able to attain them. And if we can, part of it will be through science. America needs bright young people like you to figure these things out. We need you to be the scientists of the future and to make the world a better place. Science is fun. I have to say, our jobs are really fun. I really hope that all of you will really enjoy yourselves today. And think about tomorrow and what each of you would like to do for yourselves and others in the future. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anthony Cagini. I'm the director of the National Energy Technology Laboratory. In celebration of National Lab Day, science and engineers from our laboratory will demonstrate several fun and educational science experiments. You'll make slime to learn about polymers and a process called polymerization. You'll learn how crystals from form by making crystal flowers from coal. You'll explore chemical tests of... Smiling is not in my job description. We open that Welcome to National Lab Day. We're here at uh, South Park Middle School and welcome students. Welcome uh, wherever you are. My name is Mike and I'm here with my colleagues Steve, Chuck, and Jenny. And uh, we're going to do some science together and learn some things. One of the most important things about being a scientist is learning to observe. So I'm going to ask my student volunteers here to help me and tell me what they can see about these two containers filled with ice water. Uh, can you see a difference between these two containers, girls? Anything look different? What about if you, one is foggy? What if you take your hand and wipe it on the outside? It's because it's wet on the outside, right? But this one is not. Do you do you think you might know why? Well, not that it doesn't have a lid, but we protected it from the air around it. It's trapped inside that plastic bag. So what we can learn about that is that cold makes, there's moisture in the air around us, and the cold makes it condense, so we can make, make things change states of matter. And with that, my friend Steve is going to tell us a lot about a very important gas that's all around us, and what happens when we do some really neat things when things get cold. Steve? Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm a scientist at National Energy Technology uh, Laboratory in Morgantown. I'm part of the same organization as Mike and Steve and, the other, and Chuck. Um, we use liquid nitrogen. We pull it right out of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen by volume. You breathe it in and out all the time, so it's not really harmful. But when it does get cold, it has drastically different properties, so we have to make sure that we're safe. Otherwise, we uh, can get frostbite with a vengeance. Now, we uh, use liquid nitrogen uh, for various uh, instruments on site. We, just, we don't just play with, although we do like to play with when we go out and do these shows. But we, there are various pieces of equipment that need to be kept cold to work properly. So we have this on hand all the time. So I'll just give you a little demonstration. Though, since it is cold, I'm going to um, protect myself a little bit. Since it's 400 degrees colder in this room, so I'm going to fill in this splice shield. You won't be able to hear me very carefully or very clearly, but uh, just observe what I do when I pour it into this door here. You'll see that it looks uh, a lot like water. Of course, you wouldn't want to drink it, and it may produce uh, some fog on a day like today, depending on the humidity, but 
to stand back and observe for a minute, and I'll get ready to uh, do a transfer. that uh, I overflowed the container a little bit. That's okay because it's going to splash out on the table. Uh, some of you that are close can see these little droplets floating across the top of the table. The liquid nitrogen uh, acts a lot like uh, water does when you pour it on a red hot surface. It just forms little drops and sort of scoots along. Uh, it's kind of neat to watch. And if it gets over in your direction, you know, don't touch or anything, but it won't hurt you. Uh, but I'm going to Right now, ask for a very adult volunteer. We're not going to actually let anybody uh, feel how cold minus 320F is, but we'll give you just a taste. I just want to convince you that um, that that is room temperature, right? I'm not just fooling you. Yep, it's normal. It's normal. We can fix that in a hurry. Very cold. Like very cold. Snowball. Yeah. Nowhere near liquid nitrogen temperature. We didn't give it time, but it really didn't take very long to get down to a, uh, a very cold level. I could still put my hand in it. It's not too cold for me to put my hand in it. I wasn't going to sacrifice your hand for this. Uh, I would be the sacrificial offering if I were going to give a demo like this, but we don't usually do things like that because we want to keep our hands, although, like I say, we could uh, injure ourselves real easily. I think we need to top this off a little bit, so I'll just uh, put on my shield again. Now, do you, do you folks here know how gases behave? Have you studied uh, that? Do you know what happens uh, to a gas when it's cooled down? Anybody have any idea? Yes? It freezes? If it gets cold enough, it freezes, but uh, I'll show you what happens to it before it freezes. We have here just a balloon that uh, we filled with uh, just room temperature air. I'm going to cool this balloon down as much as I possibly can. Now, what happened to the air in the balloon? It's still there. It shrunk because it got so cold gases when you cool them down enough, we'll uh, exert less pressure on the balloon, and the balloon has the balloon exerts pressure against the atmosphere. But the atmospheric pressure uh, more than ever comes the pressure of the gas at a very low temperature, so the balloon shrinks almost to nothing if we do it right. Sometimes, you can't see it here, it's kind of hard to see, but sometimes you'll actually see liquid air in the bottom of this balloon as it, uh, before it has a chance to expand back to its normal size. 
Uh, it's really hard to see, but uh, if you had a close-up view, you could see it. I saw a little bit of it. Unfortunately, with the room with so many people so far away, it's hard to see. But that is mostly uh, liquid oxygen. That's the, that's the other element in the atmosphere, the other principal element. That's the one that we uh, have to breathe to stay alive. That will also liquefy. As a matter of fact, uh, that's extremely dangerous, so we have to be careful how we handle liquid nitrogen because it will pull oxygen out of the atmosphere and it could become a fire hazard, but we're careful about such things, so we don't have that to uh, worry about today. We're not going to set the school on fire. Now, uh, one other thing about liquid nitrogen is that, of course, when it's in a liquid state, it occupies lots less volume than it does as a gas. When it goes from a liquid to a gas, uh, it expands by a factor of uh, 650 to 700. So this door, if you can imagine, if you're, to, if you're to expand this door in all three directions by a factor of 8 or 9, you get an idea of how much space the gaseous nitrogen would occupy. And we're going to give just, just a little illustration of that. We're not going to evaporate all of it right away, that is. But I have here uh, some liquid uh, detergent, dishwater detergent. We're going to make a nice, a nice mixture out of this, about the same mix that you might have uh, if you uh, do dishes at home. Do any of you guys like to do dishes at home? You know how to be politically correct, don't you? No, I hate you. Well, we'll uh, see if we can make a dishwater detergent a little bit more fun than what you're used to seeing. Now remember, the liquid nitrogen, when it boils, it expands by a factor of 650 to 700. So there's plenty of nitrogen to blow bubbles in. And we're going to keep going. There's a huge one right over here. We, do, we wouldn't want you to slip, but that bubble would be perfectly safe to burst because these bubbles are still liquid. They're not liquid nitrogen temperature. Wow. Now eventually, Matter of fact, we're just about at that point right now. We're not going to form any more bubbles when we pour more liquid nitrogen onto this mix. And that is because we have frozen the top of this mix and we've got frozen bubbles. You can't blow bubbles from ice, but you can blow bubbles from liquid. So uh, we've gone about as far with this particular experiment as we, as we can, but you can see the frozen bubbles in the container and along the, the part of the tabletop that's had a chance to get cold from the liquid nitrogen. Now I have uh, two or three more things here. Uh, it's time to put on my uh, safety gear again because I want to do another uh, refill. Yeah. like to play with. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> can't see, can't hear too much through this. Do you people like to uh, play with water balloons? Yeah. yeah. Like to throw them around and watch them smash? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we can do something else with this water balloon. Uh, we can be real creative with what we do with liquid nitrogen. I'm going to just drop this down in, and I don't really know what will happen. It may or may not survive, but we'll find out. It's a little bit different every time. But 
what happens? This balloon will happen to your hand if you uh, if you uh, if you uh, put your hand in there. So I'll just. Uh, does make the nitrogen boil quickly. That's okay. That won't hurt you. We're going to leave this in there a little bit. It's going to take some time. While we're waiting uh, for that to get cold, do you guys have any questions for Steve? Yes, sir. Uh, why does it look like, like on the top of the um, contain container? Like, why does it look like there's like a, like a cherry or something? Fog. If you if you talk about the fog that's coming out of this, that's uh, condensate out of the atmosphere. Why does it like sound like a thunderstorm when like the like the water that sounds like a thunderstorm? Why did that happen? Well, that is because. Uh, when this uh, hits the carpet or some other uh, uh, carpets are especially good, it, it evaporates real quickly and expands rather quickly. Then again, it makes the same sort of noise that a bunch of water would be if it were uh, being poured on the carpet. Uh, you'll notice uh, that uh, the carpet isn't wet. That's one thing I do uh, need to mention. It's a real interesting thing. Liquid nitrogen, even though it's a liquid, is not wet in the same sense that water is. It just evaporates right away. So we don't have that part of the mess to clean up after this demonstration. We do have quite a bit of wet stuff on the table here, but we don't have to worry about the floor at least too much. Now, how are we doing here? We're going to give that a little bit more time. And in the meantime, This will be our next candidate. <laughs> How are we doing here? Well, let's just see. Let's see how our balloon did. It does take an effort to get it out with these tongs, so it's... Frozen solid. All the way through. So we will put this safely away. And then... This will give you more of an idea of what it does to human flesh if you accidentally stick your hand in there or something. This is just the usual. Uh, well, lots of people like to freeze fruit. We do bananas or other things you can freeze. And uh, I'm going to take this chance to just top my uh, container off a little bit more, so just bear with me. I guess I actually uh, got some bubbles on myself, too, while well, that happens. It's very heavy, yes. Well, that's because I'm used. To, that is because I'm used to lifting the container. It's it'd be pretty heavy for you to lift. A liquid nitrogen isn't as heavy as water. It will float on water. It is fairly heavy, but not as heavy as a container of water. Steve, a question here. 
How much liquid nitrogen can fit in that container? How much liquid nitrogen can fit in the door? This, uh, this door will hold about uh, 10 liters or uh, a little bit less than 3 gallons. We have bigger containers. Uh, we use out of work. We have uh, we have huge tanks. Uh, actually, the 10 liters I was talking about refers to this door that I carried in. This container here is oh, maybe half that size, I guess. Maybe a gallon and a half, maybe five liters. That's a, that's a guess. We're going to give this another uh, minute or so. Um, can the fog freeze the things outside of it? The question is, can the fog freeze things outside the container? Uh, yes, it can if you have enough of it. Um, I've done that before. Some of these, some of this water here, uh, you know, may have bubbled over, but I have been able to uh, freeze water sitting outside this container just from the uh, cold vapors that come out of the container and fall on the table. It is enough to freeze it. Our banana, let's see, we might have another minute or so. Any more questions for Steve while we're waiting for the banana? Steve, is liquid nitrogen the coldest gas that we know of? No. Uh, there's uh, the coldest gas, there's a couple others that are colder, actually several. Um, Liquid helium is the coldest gas. Liquid helium, um, this is minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Liquid helium is more like minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's so cold and so uh, volatile, so to speak, it evaporates so quickly that we can't carry liquid helium around and do demos with it the way we can liquid nitrogen. And how do we make liquid nitrogen or liquid helium? How, how do we actually make that? Uh, there's a refrigeration process. You just pull it out of the air, compress it down, it heats up, then you cool it down, you let it expand or let it expand again, then it really cools down. You just keep repeating that process. And uh, you can cool just about anything that way. Yes? Is the balloon frozen there? I'm sorry, this balloon? Oh, the other balloon in the box? Uh, no, it's not frozen. We didn't leave it in there long enough. It, uh, it's, we uh, left it in there long enough to shrink it, but we didn't leave it in there long enough to go down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. Now the other balloon, let's take a look at the other balloon. It's still rock hard. Solid as a rock. It's frozen to the core. I think we're done. Okay, hang on just a second. Now, uh, I'm going to put this in this bag and uh, just Smashed around a little bit. Uh, word of warning, if any of this fruit comes your way, which it shouldn't, but if it does, don't touch it, don't put it in your mouth. Just uh, leave it lay where it is and we'll clean it up later since we have uh, protective equipment. It's real brittle, like ceramic. And extremely cold and it will stay cold for quite a while. Yes? Yes. The question was, was, is that what would happen if you put your hand in the liquid nitrogen? Question over here, Steve. If you let it thaw out long enough, could you eat the banana? Yes, it will be, it will be kind of gunky and a little bit gross, but yes, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't poison yourself or anything like that. Yes. Could the same thing happen with the watermelon? Yes. Just about any fruit will become uh, rigid like this and breakable. 
feed. In fact, that's how they freeze a lot of commercial frozen foods with liquid nitrogen. Okay, that's a good point. And uh, have any of you ever had warts taken off with liquid nitrogen? Sometimes at the lab we have some fun. We make ice cream with liquid nitrogen. Yes, and they do that at Carnegie Science Center too. I've seen. There's a question here. What would happen if you poured the soap into the liquid nitrogen? It would freeze. The soap is already frozen, though. It's still frozen. If you, you took it have... out of the bottle. I'm sorry. If you took it out of that bottle. The actual detergent in the yeah. bottle. It, it would freeze. freeze. Yes. Just about anything would, that we know of would freeze with liquid nitrogen, except a few uh, um, gases and uh, other things. But everything in everyday life that we encounter would uh, freeze with liquid nitrogen. Question over here. Paper would freeze like the banana too, right? I'm sorry? The question is, would paper freeze like the banana? Yes, but uh, it wouldn't be as noticeable because paper's all already sort of frozen, so to speak. It's. Uh, kind of solid. It's not gunky like a banana, so you don't really notice that much of a change. It just gets a little bit stiffer. Yes? Yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What happens if you put electricity in um, liquid nitrogen? Oh, that's been done. Um, People have uh, put light bulbs in liquid nitrogen, and what happens, liquid nitrogen itself doesn't conduct electricity. It's, it's an insulator. However, if you put something like a light bulb in liquid nitrogen, it becomes cooler, and, and what we know of as electrical resistance goes down. So uh, I've seen this done on the, on the video. The light bulb starts to glow real brightly because the resistance is going down brilliantly. Uh, two more questions. Yes. What about like any type of gas? Could like gas freeze too? Uh, yes. Uh, any gas will freeze. Uh, anything you think of will freeze, except for one thing under normal conditions. Uh, that gas is helium. Helium, if you uh, take it all the way down to what we call absolute zero, as close as we possibly get will not freeze, it will stay liquid under normal circumstances, but if you squeeze it with a lot of pressure, even it will uh, will uh, freeze, but it takes pressure in that case. Have you felt like a certain chemical in like a gas, like it will just randomly freeze? It will, um, what, how do you mean by randomly? Just, uh, like it will just freeze? Yes. Just about anything will freeze. Well, uh, we'll have one last thing to do. Uh, we're through with freezing everything. I need to do one more little trick. This is my finale. I don't take this stuff back with me. There's no, there's no reason to since I'm going to survive the trip anyway. I'm going to do one last transfer. Actually, before I do that, I see I still have a piece of banana left in there that I need to get out. So just bear with me a second. Well, it's being stubborn. It's frozen. It's frozen. Well, it's going to come out one way or another. Now, like I say, I don't take this stuff back with me. So just to have a little bit of fun, I can stand back and way back here. And I'll show you, you know, you guys uh, wondered some time ago about uh, what happens when it hits a floor, all that thundery sound. Well, you're going to hear that with a vengeance. <laughs> and that concludes my show.
Thanks, Steve. That was terrific. We're going to explore, nitrogen was a gas, and we're going to explore some more properties of gases. And we're going to use uh, one of my other favorite chemicals, and that's water. So we're going to do, and I need two student volunteers. I'm going to do this closer. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's see. One, two. You two right up here. Okay, push goggles on. Hold on. We're going to have a little race. You guys are you guys strong enough to hold this? That's pretty heavy. Let me make sure you can hold that. Okay. Why don't you come over here next to me and you young lady right over here. Is that too heavy for you? Okay. The object here is we're going to have a race and see who can empty their jug the fastest. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. Great job, we have a winner. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I saw both of you were trying to do the same thing. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel, terrific job. And your name? Brittany. Brittany, okay, cool. Uh, Daniel, you did a great job. I think you both were trying to do the same thing, but Daniel beat you by just a little bit. What were you trying to do with your bottles? Like, I'm trying to make like a, like a whirlpool. Like a whirlpool. That's what you were trying to do also, Brittany, right? Yeah. Why? Do you know why? Because it like, goes out faster. Why does, it, why does the water come out faster? Uh, because of like, less pressure. Probably. That's good. Brittany, you know? Um, no. Okay, well, you guys are on the right track, okay? We just learned that uh, gases around us are, have substance, okay? So if, if we have this jug filled with water and we empty the jug, if we don't have something replacing the water, what, what do we have inside the jug? We would have a vacuum. That's not good, okay? So the air, air has to displace the water in the jug. That's what we're trying to do. And by creating that whirlpool, that tornado, we give a space in the middle for the air to come into the bottle while the liquid goes out. And I think you guys did a great job. So let's give our, our classmates a, a big hand. Did a terrific job. And what we're going to do now, you guys are going to sit down, and we have our student teams, and our student teams are going to practice this. So this is actually a, a good um, this is actually a, a good team exercise. Uh, we're going to give you one full bottle, one empty bottle, and if you open your kits, each, each team should have a bag on their table. Take out that little colored connector. You can do that. You can open it yourself. Okay, reach in and grab the colored connector. Screw it on top of the... Do, do the full bottle first. Make it nice and tight. We don't want to leak water all over the place. And then invert your empty bottle and put it on top and screw it on nice and tight. Okay. Yeah, now, this does it. We'll see, we'll, we'll try to have a five-way race and we're going to try to do the same thing. When I say go, we're going to flip these over. We're going to flip these over and try to make a tornado. And I'm going to give you a hint. I did suggest, yep. That, um, that you can do this as a team because when you do this, rest the rest the lower bottom on, on the table so someone can hold it on the table while the second person tries to make your tornado. So let's see if we can do that. Is it, are all the teams ready? All the teams are ready. On your mark, get set and go. Let's see if you get there first. Shake it, 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 I think Johnny has it. Oh, they're going to do it. We have a winner. All right. Cool. Way to go, guys. So you guys, so what we learned, what we should learn from this, again, is that air has substance. Okay? It exerts pressure. So remember that word. That, that's a great word, pressure. Okay? Our bottles are emptying. There you go. How do you do it? She can do it, but we can do it.
Okay, if you're done, please disassemble your bottles and put the empty bottle on the table. You can leave the full bottle right where it's at, but we're going to need those empty bottles for our next next experiment. All right, what we're going to do next, we're taking them apart. We need our empty bottle without the connector. We're going to reach into our bags and take out a balloon. Okay, now watch for just a moment, because I want you guys and gals to make sure that, that we're doing it right. So if you've never practiced blowing up balloons, we're going to stretch it a little bit. Okay, that usually helps. And just to prove that the balloon will blow up, you'll practice blowing up your balloon like this. Okay, so we know the balloon fills up. Once we're, once we're confident that we know how to blow up a balloon, we're going to insert our balloon into our empty bottle. And you're going to take the edge of the balloon and stretch it over the top. And then you're going to try to blow up the balloon one more time, like this. Okay. So, yeah, it collapsed. Why? Because, well, let's see. Let's see if you guys and gals can do that. Yeah, you better pick the person in your team who's got the biggest lungs and the loudest voice. Oh. <laughs> you can go ahead and get started. No, it's me. Put your mouth on the hand. It's me. Alright, stop before you have to energetic on the guy. Did everyone blow up their balloon while it was outside? Did you make sure that you blow up your balloon? This might work. Anybody blow up your balloon yet? Has anybody tried yet? Yes. Has every team tried? You sure you have the person with the biggest breath? You look like you're working. I'm going to trade. Put your balloon in my bottle. See if you can do this. Isn't it balloon? Here, I'll help. Wait, we're starting to get Yeah. Here, I'll try. Don't pass out. Here, I'll help. Let's let Jan try. No. Let me try one more. Come on, guys. Let's share one. She's going to use my bottle. No, that's okay. What's your name? Come on. Nice to meet you, Morgan. I'm going to try mine. I'm going to try mine. Watch what Watch what happens. Oh, honey. Okay, that's good for you. We don't have any of them. They all have them. They're blow hard. One day, one day, one day. I don't care. Yeah, get like that. Mark, it's it. Here you go. Yeah, I do that Let's see. Is that really easier? Yeah. Yeah. Like this, maybe? It goes better. Ah! Remember what I said about being a scientist? You have to make observations. So I cheated a little bit. What, 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 what's your name? Brittany. Brittany said, that's right, you helped me with the water race. Brittany said there's a hole in the bottom of my bottle. Why would that make a difference in trying to blow up our balloons? Less pressure. What do you need less pressure? Where's there like, less pressure? Because like in a bottle, there's, when you put on the um, the balloon, it, the pressure gets trapped and then... Right, okay, so we have air trapped in the bottle 
If we don't have a hole in our bottom, we have air trapped in there and it's pushing back on our balloon. So I'm trying to blow up the balloon and the air is pushing back on the balloon and I can't fill it up. So I tried to play a trick on you guys. I think you guys are good sports. So give yourselves a big hand. Okay, nice work, you guys. Good job. I'll take my balloon back. All right, cool. All right, the, um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to investigate some more properties of gases and we're going to start uh, focusing on carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. No, actually, actually, um, yeah, well, if you reach into your can, in your bag, there should be a film can and some Alka-Seltzer. Okay. This is the Alka-Seltzer. Yes, sir. Oh, good question. Okay, Alka Seltzer. Alka Seltzer is mostly baking soda, and the chemical formula for that is sodium bicarbonate. Okay. Uh, now, the the thing about Alka Seltzer is we're going to learn that when we mix uh, baking soda with an acid, we generate carbon dioxide. That's what we're going to do in just a moment. Alka Seltzer also contains a what's called a dry acid. It contains um, uh, tartaric acid. So the two chemicals don't react with one another. By the way, both of, you'll find both of these in your mom's or dad's uh, kitchen cupboard because they're both used in baking and cooking. Uh, so they're perfectly safe. And But they don't react with one another until we add a solvent. So we, we need for a way for them to mix. And when we add a solvent, and that's going to be our tap water, when we add the solvent, They'll be allowed to react with one another, and then we're going to see what's going to happen. So open your packets of Alka-Seltzer, and you're going to take one tablet and break it in half. We only need half a tablet to do this, okay? And then fill your, fill your can with approximately half full with water, and put the cap on as quickly as you can. Yeah, make sure you're wearing your, your safety glasses and don't don't point the can at anyone. Oh, ours popped. And we have a little bit of water, so we can just clean that up with. There you go. Okay, you have extra Alka Seltzer tablet, so if you want to try it again, you're welcome. Yes. Right. See the smaller one. See if there's a difference. Why don't we just put the tablet Wait, wait, wait. Okay. paper towel and clean up the water a little bit, we're going to move on to our next activity. And if you're done with your Alka-Seltzer activity, 
<laughs> Why don't we have one of your team members take out, there's a, there's a plastic bag inside your plastic bag. And take out the bag that's inside of that plastic bag. And if you have your plastic bag, raise your hand. Okay, so you're the first one. You're going to come out here. Or is still trying to talk again? Ah. Who else has a plastic like bag? Number two, and we'll take this gentleman from down here. Oh, here goes. Okay. So, we talked with Steve before. Watch the wires very carefully. Thank you. I'm going to move this down here. Okay. So, Steve talked about what happens when we cool down gases, we saw what happens. The molecules get close together and it shrinks, right? So what would you expect to happen if we did the opposite? If we heated up a gas, what would happen? They separate. They separate, they expand, the gas expands. And what we're gonna do is we're going to make hot air balloons. So, um, what's your name? Jared. Jared, who's on Jared's team? Okay, we need, we need uh, four folks from, come on over and help Jared. And what's your name? Taylor. Taylor. Taylor's team, come on over here. Okay. And you are? Alan. Alan's team, come on over here. Okay. Let's see. So, we're going to give you guys a hairdryer. Here's what we're going to do. You're, you're going to be in charge of the hairdryer. We need... We need uh, two, two members of the team to hold the bag open. Three is okay, okay? You have one of the most important jobs. We're going to turn on our hair dryers, not just yet, so we, I can give you the instructions. And we're going to fill our bags with hot air for one minute, all right? And, um, and it's, it's really important that when our timekeeper tells you it's time that the person with the hair dryer supplying the hot air turn off the hair dryer first. That's the first important thing that has to happen. And then quickly our timekeeper is going to say one, two, three, go. And on the count of go, everyone holding the bag has to let go at exactly the same time. So this takes a little bit of practice. We should have three hair dryers. Where are the other hair dryers? There's one over here. Okay, I, I apologize. Let's have a team over here. This team over here. Great. And the third one. Okay. On the other side of the table. Okay, so sorry guys. If you guys can go back around to the other side of the table and one of our helpers is going to give you some help there. You guys, step over here just a little bit. Okay. You guys are doing great. Watch the chords. Super job. Okay, outstanding. Okay. Katie, do you have a, uh, sorry, Jenny, do you have a, a wristwatch? Okay, who's our timekeeper here? Okay, you're gonna use my wristwatch. About a minute, a little bit longer is okay. Two shorts, not good. So each team, when you're ready to get started, go ahead and make your hot air balloon. It got caught on your on your bracelet. Try it again. Okay, remember we gotta turn the hair dryer off first. Oh, you guys didn't let go at the same time. Try it again.
Yeah, don't, don't move on like like your to your life. Just with the tips of your fingers. It's not going anywhere. Okay, and then and you guys do archery. And you guys ever do archery? You gotta have a light, real light feel, right? You gotta let go real quick. Okay, nice and easy. Boom. Okay, don't hang on to it when when they say go. Alright, you guys aren't following directions, alright? What we're gonna do is we're gonna turn it off and then three, two, one, go. Okay, you guys are letting go as soon as he turns before he has a chance to turn off the hair dryer. One more time, real quick. Okay? Right, ready? Go. Turn it on. So it's tipping over before you have a chance to let it float. So they get on camera and they look good. Team, go up with Katie and try it out. Okay. Go. Let's go. Oh, we need, we need a couple of people. And then it flips over. Hey, empty. Okay, you guys. If you go back to your seats and put this back in the bag where you found it, I appreciate that. Okay. Okay, guys. Last team, come on up. Let's see if you guys can do it. All right. So if you watch. All right, some of the teams have trouble with their bags. Okay, the, the trick here is, is, to, is to let go at the same time. Okay, we'll do this together. You guys ready? Okay. On high. Hot. Ready? And turn it on. Cool. Right, and you're like holding on with a depth grip. Just hold on with two fingers as lightly as you can. Okay, because you want to let go real fast. And I'm gonna, after I tell, tell him to turn it off, I'm gonna count down. One, two, three, go. And you let go on the word go. I Five seconds, we're going to turn the heat off. Oh, yeah. Heat's off. One, two, three, go. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Ready? One more time. Here we go. Okay. I got it. You can throw the balloons in too. 
turn it off. Oh, it didn't work. All right. So sometimes it takes a little bit of practice, but how many teams got their, their hot air balloon to work? Good. It takes a little bit of practice. You guys did a great job. Give yourselves a big hand. Okay. All right. And now Leah is going to demonstrate our CO2 volcano. Oh, we have questions. Okay, let's start. Let's start with the young ladies in the back. Why is hot air lighter than cold air? Okay, um, it's 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 called density. So density is defined as the amount of stuff or mass per unit volume. So when the molecules spread apart, there's less stuff per unit volume. So uh, it's less it's less dense and it's, it, it floats. Okay, and yes, ma'am. Well, so we just I just said that hot air is less dense, so things that are less dense float. Let's we these girls in the front. Why didn't our balloons float? Okay. Um, they should have floated. There are a couple of reasons why the experiment may not have worked. Okay. One is if you didn't let go all let go at the same time, one end of the bag starts to rise first and then the hot air escapes and then it just falls. Another sometimes we get holes in the top and the, and the hot air doesn't stay trapped in the bag. So like I said, it does take a little bit of practice, but uh, my assistants, Jenny and Leah, uh, they didn't believe me either. We practiced, we made it work, didn't we? Okay, so it takes a little bit of practice. So uh, sometimes when we do an experiment, it, it always doesn't work on the first try. We have to make sure that uh, we've got what we call variables. We've worked out all the variables and uh, we're, we're only testing one thing at a time. Who else had a question? Oh, I had. I saw a bunch of hands up before. I guess we were all kind of going in the same direction on our question. So that's that's pretty good. Repeat the question. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, I'm the TV guy. What can I tell you? All right. Leah is gonna Leigh is gonna show us our our I'll, volcano. I'll be, the, I'll be the hand if you'll give us a little can bit. Can you more give her the mic? Also some, uh, thank you. And also some glitter. And what color is um, magma when it comes out of a volcano? You guys can all answer together because you know you're all going to know the right answer. Go ahead. Ready? One, two, three. Red. red. So I put a little bit of red food coloring in here. And I also have a volcano. Have you guys made volcanoes here at school before? No. No. Well, my volcano has a special hole in the bottom so I can fit my bottle in it. So that you can't see that it's in there. And then what we're going to add to it is a little bit of just regular vinegar. And the vinegar and the baking soda are going to react. And that's going to cause a reaction on top of the volcano. So what do you think is going to happen? It's going to um, push it off and then like all the um, baking soda. Mm -hmm. The gases are all going to try to rise up because the, remember the bottle's small, so it's going to push its way out through the top, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You have a funnel. I'm good. Should. So Mike, can you come tell us a little bit more about how the reaction actually happened with the two different chemicals? Well, they're not really chemicals because you can find them in your kitchen. But. Well, actually, that's not, that's not true. Uh, they are chemicals. Chemicals are all around us. It, it's just a question of whether or not they're safe. So um, baking soda is a chemical, but we use it to cook with. Vinegar consists of acetic acid and water, and it's perfectly safe. We use it for cooking and for pickling and so on and so forth. So just remember that the chemicals can be our friends, they can become medicines, they can help us uh, paint things and, and protect things, uh, but chemicals can also be dangerous. So we have to understand them and respect them. But, but what we have here is, again, uh, baking soda is sodium bicarbonate, and the bi means it's got an, an H in it, and uh, carbonate means it contains CO2. So when we react, react that with the acid, the acid liberates the carbon dioxide and pushes all the water out there. We form all those bubbles very quickly. 
and it pushes the liquid out the top, pushes our, our bubbles out the top. So I think Leia did a great job. Let's, yeah. give, let's give her a big hand. So if we have it, so I think we, we cleaned up, we cleaned up from our, our gases, and now we're going to explore some chemical reactions. So we're going to open up our next next set of kits. You're going to get. You're going to have in your kit some pipettes. And you're going to need, we're going to ask you to put on some rubber gloves because we will be handling. Put, put your gloves and your safety glasses on, please. And while you're doing that, let me just explain that we're going to test uh, some common household materials for their acidity or basicity. So we, we've heard the term acids and bases or acid and alkaline and generally speaking most of the time we like things that are close to neutral. Water should be neutral, okay, and things we put in our body are generally close to neutral. But we're going to look at some materials here. We've got some handout sheets for you. So you're going to find your pH paper and you're going to find a... Um, you should have a petri dish in your kit. So if you can, after you have your gloves on, start with your petri dish, and you're going to need to tear your pH paper into tiny pieces. You're going to have to make that into eight, eight small pieces of, of pH paper. Okay. You can put you can put one piece of paper in your petri dish at a time. You can also take out of your out of your out of your kit a pen to record your results and a drop uh, and a, there's a bag of, of pipettes in there those little plastic droppers so we need to have those okay. yes take the pipettes out of the plastic bag you can just put them on the table did it get wet. Do you have a paper towel? That's just water. Basically cleaned up. Okay. And then take out, there should be a group of vials with a rubber band around them. You can take the rubber band off. Okay. And your vials each contain one sample of tap water, salt water, sugar water, orange juice, lemon juice, a sodium bicarbonate solution, ammonia, and vinegar. And we're going to test them one at a time. So you're going to take a strip and put it in your petri dish, very good, and then one of your teammates will take a pipette, and I would suggest doing these in the order on the sheet of paper. So test your tap water first. And then once you've used your pipette, you don't want to contaminate your other samples. So you have one pipette for each sample. Take your pipette after you've used it and put it back in the plastic bag. That way you know it's already been used. You only need one drop. That's way too much. We're going to need one drop. One drop of sample to test. That's all we need. That's good. And just carefully one drop. Watch the color and record on your piece of paper. Okay, compare it to the color on your on your sheet of paper and then tell me what what was the color when it first came out? Seven, okay? Yeah, it was six or seven. So that's tap water. Remember, after you use your pipe pen, put it back in the plastic bag so you know not to use it again. One drop. One drop. Okay. Take a clean pipette and reach for your next sample. Why don't you show you the whole team so they can all write down what they think it is too. You want a clean piece of, of pH paper now. So put a clean piece of pH paper in there. I, I want uh, salt water. Okay, five or six, okay. Everyone grab a drop. Everyone grab a drop. And you can just take a drop of these papers. 
And you have a vial labeled baking soda. That's that's the same thing. That's what you want to use. Uh, what was lemon juice? Too? Yeah. Uh, sir, it's labeled. Uh, it baking soda. That's a thirteen. Oh, the 
Oh, that's a, oh, that's a 13. Yeah, 13. Uh-uh, look at that. That's a 13. See, because it has that green tip. 10? Yeah, that's nine. Yeah, that's nine. Okay. Alright, I call them Benjamin. I already have one. Guys, 13. Why do you even do that? But still, it's a 13. Ammonia. Yeah, eventually they all sort of turn. I didn't do it. I got my gloves done. Okay, it looks like we're all getting to the end. We're almost all done. So what you should have observed is that three of our samples are neutral. Tap water is neutral. Sugar and salt solutions were neutral. And then we got to a couple of uh, samples that tested for acid. Two of them were orange juice and lemon juice. Anybody know what kind of fruits oranges and lemons are called? Citrus fruits. And you know what they contain? They contain citric acid. Okay? So that's the acid that you tested in your, in your lemon juice and your orange juice. And then if you haven't got to the vinegar yet, that one tested very acid, and we mentioned before when Leah did our demonstration that that's acetic acid dissolved in water. Now, the um, if I if I were to tell you that a salt is the product of an acid and a base, would you expect it to test acid, or would you expect it to test base? What would you expect the salt to test? Wait, two. Anybody know? Anybody paying attention? Yes. Okay, that was that's one answer. Anybody think differently? A salt should, should a salt test acid or base? I know. I said it's up there too. Anybody want to try one more? It should test neutral, right? It's the product of an acid and a base, and they cancel each other out. So salt should test neutral. What about sugar? We tested sugar dissolved in water. It is neutral. It's neither an acid, nor a base, nor a salt. It's a different kind of chemical compound. It's an organic compound, and it's none of the above. But it does dissolve in water, and it should test just like tap water. It should, should have given you the same result. Okay. If, if, you're done, if you're done recording your results, I'd like you to... Uh, Put your uh, pieces of, of uh, pH paper back into the plastic bag, and you can put the vials back in the plastic bag, and also your um, your pipettes. You know, before you do that, take out the remainder of your kit because you're going to need the remainder of your kit. It's going to be easier if we do that. So why don't we have one member of the team take out the remainder of your kit, and the other members of the team clean up what we've already done. Okay. So now we're going to do we're going to do an iodine test. So you can take your four food samples. We have a piece of apple and a piece of onion. Actually, we have five food samples. We have some cracker. We have a a packet of sugar and a packet of artificial sweetener. I'm going to suggest, if you would, before you go any further, start with the cracker. Most of you should have at least two crackers. Put one cracker in your dish, in a clean dish. Okay, wipe your dish with, with the paper towel on your... And then... And I promise you everything in here is clean. Take a sec... One of the team members, take a cracker, put it in your mouth for just a second. And then put it... Yeah, it's safe. And it, just put it in your mouth and wet it. And I'll put it in the dish. Okay. Can I have one of your crackers? Yeah, this might. Okay. You have you have bottles of iodine. Just open your. Uh, iodine bottles, and you can take, put a drop of iodine on, on your cracker. Uh, both of them. This one, this is clean. If you have a clean pipette, you can use a clean pipette to make sure it's clean. Okay, good. Now you can put put.
put the, uh, your other samples in there as well. Your apple, onion. Tear open your packets of sugar and, and, and sweetener. Yes, you put iodine on your food samples. I'll do the onions. There you go. That's right. I love onions. Test your other food samples. observations or think about your observations and then you're going to have to clean that out and do your wear on your hand. That's on your glove. That's why we're wearing gloves. Oh, you know what? In that case, you can get rid of He's got it's the package. It's the blue packet. Sure. The blue packet. Well, we're going to put this in the bag and clean it up. Do you really like this? Looks like a smile. What happens if we put iodine on sugar? Yeah, I'm trying to do it. So, yeah, just, make a, just make a little pile of the corn. You can tear that open. It's a Okay, that's good. We don't have to do the whole pile. Alright. Perfect. Okay, just a drop. Coffee. Okay. Oh, it's it is. Yes. Okay. And when you're done with your observations, make sure you cap up your bottle of iodine and put everything back in the bag. How, how are we doing here? Okay. What what did some of what what are some if you haven't finished yet? What are some of your observations so far? Okay. Okay. So it looks like coffee grinds. So what color is the iodine? How many how many teams looked at the color of just plain iodine? What color is the iodine? It's a it's a reddish brown. It's reddish brown. A, mo a lot of people describe it as red. Depends on. So if you have just plain iodine. It's a reddish brown color, and one of two things happened. Okay, we we added it. The most dramatic thing is someone said the, the color of coffee grinds. We added it to certain foods, and they turned black. Which foods turned black? The cracker. Okay. Anything else? Artificial. And the artificial sweetener. Okay. What's special about the? Now uh, we have. We have uh, we had an onion, an apple, sugar. Okay, what food groups did we have? Anybody know? Like sort of like fruits. Okay, we had fruits. What what food group does does the uh, cracker belong to? Grains. 
grain. And what's in grain? Does anybody know? Wheat. Okay, wheat is a grain. One more get. One more. Anybody else? What? 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 What is in grains? What? Okay, that's okay. You might not know the word. We're looking for the word starch. Okay, grains contain starch. Uh, so. What, what we observed with the cracker was called the starch iodine complex. When starch and iodine get together, they form a complex that appears to be black. Okay? So uh, fruits do not contain starches. We didn't see that with our, nor do vegetables. Okay? So we didn't see that. What if we had a potato? If we had a potato, what do you think would have happened? I think it would have like, it like, turned like, sort of like a bark and put it on the why would it? Have, why would a potato turn black? Uh, because it's like I'll give you a hint. Okay, if we go to our food group and look at our charts, right? We are uh, potatoes are called a starchy vegetable, so they contain starch, as does corn and a few other root vegetables. So um, that's that. The the onion is not a vegetable that contains starch, and our sugar is not a starch, but our artificial sweetener turned black. Does anybody know why that turned black? Uh, because sugar has starch. Like no, we just said that sugar is not a starch. Okay, that's a good. That was a good. In fact, starches are made up of sugar molecules, but but that's not the answer. Good, good guess. Anybody know? Okay, it's not the actual artificial sweetener that turned black. It's the filler. They put a starch filler in the packet. And that's what reacted with the iodine. So, so we learned today that if we want to identify foods or any material that contains starch, we can do an iodine test. So if we uh, all clean up our, our workstations, we're going to move on to our next activity and demonstration and learn how we make energy. Yes, ma'am. You can just put it in the bag and we'll clean it up for you, OK? Yes, into that bag. Okay. Into the bag. Just leave, leave that in there too. I don't believe it. We don't need gloves for the rest of the experiments, do we? No, 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 you don't. Okay, we, we will be handling some lemons later, so if you don't mind a little bit of lemon juice on your hands, you can take off your, your gloves.
something more specific. Yes? Natural um, gas. Natural gas is another one. Okay, you had your hand up. Uh, sun. Solar, yes, very good. Electricity. Electricity, very good. That's the one I was looking for. Electricity. Now, where do we get our electricity? How do we get our electricity? Yes? From like a, like a coal mine. Oh, yeah, coal has a lot to do with it. I'll take one more answer. Okay. Fossil fuels, yeah, 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 you're very good. Usually somebody says out of the wall over there where those two prongs are. No, that's not where we get our electricity. We get our electricity from a variety of sources, and they're all shown right here, okay? The majority of our electricity comes from coal. What we do is we take energy in one form, and we have to transform it to energy of another form that we can use. So we have coal, natural gas, and oil. Does anybody know what kind of energy sources those are? Uh, those are um, like electricity. Well, they make electricity, but um, uh, there's a term for those three types of uh, sources of fuel. Yes? Fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, right. These are fossil fuels. And they're named fossil fuels because they come from very ancient plants. Plants that are millions and millions of years old, hundreds of millions of years old, that were laid down over time. They turn into coal, natural gas, and oil. And you'll notice we get quite a bit of our electricity from there. Nuclear is another source of electricity. That's a big one in this country. Hydro. Anybody know what hydro is? Uh, yeah, you in the back. Water? Water, yes. And what we're doing is we're storing water behind a dam of some type. We're building up energy in that water height, and then we're re releasing it to generate energy. Wind and solar. So you guys are very good. You picked them all. Now, what the majority of all these energy sources, except for solar, have in common is they have to make some, a fluid move, okay? Now, we're all familiar with fluids. Water is a fluid. But I bet you didn't know air could be a fluid, too. And what we do is we generate steam, in most cases, and we use this steam to turn a turbine. Now, what's a turbine? Anybody know what a turbine is? Oh, I got to say, too. Yes? Like fan. Well, a fan is a good example. A fan is a good example of a turbine. In fact, that's what I have right here. This is a little fan, okay? It's a fan out of a computer. And it's designed so that when you put five volts into it, the fan turns. But I bet you didn't know that if you run a fan backwards, if you blow a fluid over the fan, you can generate electricity. Did anybody know that? Well, who would like to give me a hand? I'm going to need a couple volunteers. And I'm going to need volunteers for the whole thing, so I'll... I'll start with Bruce. Okay, we'll start with you two ladies first. Come on up. Uh, yes, you and you. And what I have here is called a voltmeter. Okay, it's a meter and it measures voltage. I'd like to, uh, this side of the table, please. Let's see if I can get this to work. There's a little stand there. And you can read those. Now I'm going to hook these up to these two leads right here. And if you could stand to one side, and you can stand to the other side so they can see you. What's the voltage reading on the fan right or on the voltmeter right now? 0, 0.0, okay? So we're not generating any electricity. Now, what do I have in my hand? Can of air. Uh, put your hand up. Right, just there. Now remember, I said air can be a fluid. Watch what happens when I spray this. What's happening to the voltage? 
going up. What did it read at the highest? Uh, two. two volts. So we're getting about two and a half volts out of that. Now that's the same way as a wind generated turbine works. But most electricity is generated by turning a turbine like that with a fluid using steam or whatever. So what is electricity? Does anybody know what electricity is? You may sit down. Thank you. Yes? I saw it. It's like, what we get, like, how we get, like, our power. Well, yeah, it's how we get our power, but I'm looking for specifically, scientifically. Does anybody know what electricity is? Give you one more shot. Well, some, like, weather things are electricity. Like You're right. Lightning is electricity. Exactly. But what that is, is it's a flow of something called an electron. An electron is part of an atom. They circle around the outside of the atom. Everybody seen that little model of a ball in the center and this orbit's going around it? Mm -hmm. Those orbits going around that center is the electron. Now, in order for us to get electricity, we have to use those electrons. But those electrons are bound to their atoms very tight. And they like to stay there. They're comfortable there. So we have to put some energy in to force those electrons out. And one way of doing that with a turbine is that you take a coil of wire, just a simple coil of wire, and some magnets. And you either pass the coil over the magnets or the magnets over the coil. Now, I need my next two volunteers from this table. Okay, I'll take, uh, I'll take, I'll take you, and you had your hand up first. Come on up. We're going to use our multimeter again, and I'd like you two to turn around so that the camera can see you. And you can say your names. Emma. Emma. Miles, Miles I've got to get your names. Um, Crystal. Crystal. I'm Miranda. 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 I'm Miranda. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we have is we have a coil of wire, and we have some magnets. So if you would hold the coil of wire just as I'm holding well, I need you to hold it sort of like this, okay? Because we're going to do something special with it. Yeah, there we go. And if you could turn around this way. Okay. And what I need you to do is take these magnets, and I'll need one more volunteer. You had your hand up very quick. Okay. And your name? Mallory. Mallory? Okay. Your job is to watch the voltmeter. Now, what, tell everybody real loud what the voltmeter is reading right now. 0.0. 0. 0.0. 0. 0. Okay. So what I need you to do is take those magnets and drop them straight through that hole. And when he does that, you tell me what the voltmeter says. Go ahead. Just drop them. I'll catch them. And went up to eight. Okay? Let's do it one more time. Ready? Go. 3.0. 3.0. So it depends on how fast they go through, how much electricity we make. But what we did was, by using these magnets, we knocked some of those electrons loose in those wire, in the copper in that wire, and we were able to force them to move. Thank you very much. And what we did was, we acted the same as the power plant. By pushing those magnets through the wire, we jet knocked those electrons loose. We were able to send them down the wire so where they can get used in your house. Okay? Now, we talked about coal, oil, gas, nuclear, hydro, solar, wind. How else do we get electricity? Yes? Kolodzik, please report to room 101 for coverage. Kolodzik to 101 for coverage. Yes. Okay, well, what's a, everybody, I'm sure, has an MP3 player, right? Yeah. An iPod. What makes the iPod work? What device of the iPod makes it work? Um, what gives it the electricity? Okay. Some sort of battery. Batteries, right. Now, what is a battery? A battery, yeah, okay. Electrons. A battery generates electrons, right. But it does it by chemical energy. What we've been talking about up to now is taking something that has stored chemical energy, releasing that chemical energy as heat, using that heat to turn water into steam, using that steam as our fluid to turn the fans of the turbine, and then using that with the magnets attached to it to push the electrons through. But a battery works in a different way. And this is a picture of an old battery down here. This is what's called a carbon battery. Typically, you don't find these anymore. Uh, everybody uses lithium batteries or alkaline batteries, but they all work the same way. It's a chemical reaction. 
What you're doing is you're using the chemicals and changing their structure to release the electrons and make them flow. Okay? But there's ways of getting making a battery without doing that. And you can do it very simply. A lemon, right? Now what did we just learn about lemons in the last segment? Ah, hey you have Citric acid, yes, correct. Lemons contain citric acid. Okay, so I have a lemon, and what do I have here? Yes? Copper penny and a And a nickel. Okay? I have two different metals. Now, what's gonna what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the next group at the table. That's, uh, okay, you two, come on up. And we're going we're gonna to experiment here making a little battery. But what I'm going to do first, if you'll come around this way and face the camera, and tell us your name. Laura. Laura. Brittany. Brittany. I bet you didn't know your body was a battery. It generates electricity. And you can see that with the multimeter. So what I'm going to do, and I'll call the next table up to help me with this too, is when I touch these two leads together, tell me what the voltage reads. 0.0. 0. 0.0. 0. Now watch what happens now. What's the voltage read? Six. 72, 78, 80. I'm generating electricity in my body just by holding these. Now, I'd like you to hold one in each finger. What are you generating? 90, oh, 100. Wow, you're much more electrically active than I am. Boy, look at that, you're over 100. Okay, let's see what you can do. Oh, you're up there too. I must just be old. I don't have any electricity left. Uh, let me get two more volunteers for the electricity. You, th you, you two stay because I want you to help me with the battery. Okay? Let's see what these two gentlemen can do with the electricity. You're going to answer all my questions. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel? CJ. CJ. Okay. Daniel, let's see what you got. Well, you're even higher. 135, 140, 150. Wow. Okay. Now your turn. Let's see what we can do here. 130, you're doing great. Oh man, I, 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 gotta, I gotta get some energy here. I have no energy left. Look at that. 14, 9, 7. Oh, you guys embarrass me. Thank you. You can make sit down. Okay, if we got time afterwards when we're all done, I'll let everybody try this, okay? Usually I go around the class and let everybody try this one because they all have fun. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the lemon, I'm gonna make two little cuts in it so that we can get our metal in. Okay? And I'm going to hook it up to the multimeter. If you would hold that for me, please. Uh, there we go. I need the wire end. Okay. Now, what do you think is going to happen when I stick these two metals into the lemon? Well, we're talking about electricity, so obviously we're going to do what? Like electricity. Okay. Can you find where I made those little slots? If not, I'll make I'll make more. Oh, you got it. Very good. There's one. Okay. And where did I put the other one? Yeah, I'll just make another one. How's that? Remember where that one is. There we go. I see the lemon juice coming out. Okay. We're connected. Now, don't worry because it says it's negative. That just means I have the leads hooked up backwards. But are we generating electricity? Yes. We're generating how much? Eight, well, let me reverse these so that, that we're reading the proper way here. We're generating what? About 86, right? Now, that's not volts because I'm on a very small scale. That's uh, millivolts. That's a thousandth of 86 thousandths of a volt. There we go, 105. So we're making about 0.1 volts. Okay, thank you. Next table, two volunteers. One, two. Come on up, guys. I have here now two zinc nails. Okay, what's your name? Jared. Jared? Dan. Dan? Okay. Well, you take one nail, and what we're going to do is we're going to replace, now I'm going to give you the other nail, we're going to place the nickel with the one nail, okay? So when I pull this nickel out, you slide it into that slot. Okay? And, whoa, we're getting a lot of electricity now. Look at that. I had to go up to a higher scale. We're getting half a volt. Not enough to run your iPod, but we're getting close now. Now, why do you think we're getting more electricity? 
Yes, quick. Because a zinc nail has like a, a metal is like certain. Like well, you're on the right track. Exactly. Okay, put your nail in right there. Push it in hard. Okay. Now I got two. What happens is metals have different ability to give up their electrons. Some are easier to give up electrons than others. Zinc on this nail is very easy to give up its electrons. So it gives a lot more energy. Now we're going to connect two galvanized nails in the, in the lemon. What do you think is going to happen? Am I going to get a voltage, yes or no, everybody? Yes. Yeah, okay. Anybody say no? Okay, let's see what happens. This is the last experiment. Well, yes, I do. I get a little bit of electricity, but not anywhere near before. Before I got half a volt. Now I'm getting 0 0.02 volts. I thought zinc was a better metal. Why? Why are we not getting as much electricity? One guess. Yeah. Because there is another metal hooked up. Well, yes, you're on the right track. Because we're using the same metal. The battery works because you're using two different metals to drive electrons from one to the other. When you're using the same metals, you don't get that driving force. So therefore, you don't get as much electricity. Okay? I'd like to thank everybody that helped me. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. What we're going to do now, boys and girls, you have kits on your table, and you're going to make your own lemon battery. So if you open your kits and take out your lemons, and then you have a little plastic bag with a variety of metals that you can post on your lemons. My suggestion is so that we do this activity as quickly as possible, we will put all five metals in at once and then run our test. And you have a piece of paper to record your results on. So, uh, and then you have your own mold, one, one test meter per group, okay? And all we need to do is turn that to the on position. It will be ready for you when you guys are set to go. Okay. Yeah, so take, take, so you should have four nails and a piece of copper wire, and I would recommend if you watch me, it says copper and steel, so we're going to take the copper wire, just poke it in the lemon like that, and the steel wire is the very skinny one, and we'll just poke it in like that. And then it says a bright galvanized. That's the one with the big fat head and it's smooth. And we'll poke it in like that. The next one is the dark galvanized. And we'll poke it in like that. And the last one is aluminum. And we poke it in like that. So now hook up one lead to the copper. And then connect connect your to the, to the steel nail right there. Do one at a time. And wait a few seconds and record the voltage that you see on the scale. And just like my friend Chuck said before, the negative just means that we've got the wires hooked up backwards. So if I swap those, we should get exactly the opposite number. Instead of minus 0.44, we should get where's the big one? Plus four four. Oh, actually, we got 0.64. Okay, so it took a little while. Whoops. Right here. Okay, there you go. Okay, so you got 0 0.64. Yeah, what you want to do Okay, so write that down on your on your sheet, and we're just going to move that down one. Wait a few seconds. Leave your clippers on here. Right, that's correct. So you put 0 0.64 in that box. It's, you can leave either and one. Now what do you have on your meter? It should be about the same. One point one three. So this is copper and bright yeah. galvanized. And then you're just going to keep moving the black one down with the copper. So I'm going to move this down so with the dark galvanized. And, and test okay. the copper and wait a few seconds. And then you're going to test this one with all of this. So you have one point zero one. Okay. This works better if we have more time and we let the meter stabilize. And then that one. And we're going to slide this down to the meter. Okay. And what do we have now? Okay, that's all right. 0 0.76 or 0 0.77. Right. So now we're just going to move the copper lead over to the steel like this. Okay. And we start testing all over it. We connect this to copper. And what do we get? Minus 0.95. 
Minus zero point nine. Point nine seven. Point nine eight was the highest. Seven. And then the or eight. Okay. You guys doing okay? Yep. Okay. Nine point one. Nine point seven. Nine point seven. Nine point seven. I like to get 0 0.4 so yeah. And we're going to switch this to the dark galvanized. And then you have 0 0.4. We'll put this on the aluminum. Yeah, no, they're there. Two two? I'm reading these upside down. So if I make a mistake, tell me I'm wrong. Two one, okay. And then we're gonna start and move the red one to the aluminum. I'm sorry, to the bright galvanized. And start putting this on the top. No, you move the black one. Yep. We have minus point nine. Zero point nine four five, something like that. Okay. And then we move this down to the steel. And we have zero point four two. Oh yeah. We're gonna move this down. Okay. And what do we have? Exactly. Zero, zero, four, point, zero, four. Now, we have minus zero point two two. Slide this down to the dark we'll move this up to the top. And negative two. Minus yeah. 0.89. Zero point, minus that's zero point point eight. Eight. It's point two with eyes. And then no, dark negative. galvanized and steel. No, that's because I'm back. Minus wow. zero point three seven. What are you guys doing? You put this in the mail right now. And then we got twelve. Then we'll check our dark galvanized and bright galvanized, and we have zero point zero six. And jumping down to dark galvanized Whoa. aluminum, and we get minus 0 0.1. Okay, last set to go. We're going to test the aluminum. 0.39. And we'll start with aluminum and copper, and we get minus 0 0.65. Point one. Aluminum and steel, we get minus zero point one six. I'm going to move this down to the bright galvanized. Plus zero point two six. And down to the dark galvanized. This is our last me measurement. And zero point two zero. Okay. If you had some help from an adult, you should be done. Uh, some of you are doing a great job. It looks like you're almost done. What you should see from your charts, if you did your experiments, now within experimental error, that means that we don't always get the exact same number. If you have a, a pair where the red was on copper and the black was on a metal, on, on some other metal, and you switch those two, you should have pretty much the same voltage except the sign changed, plus to minus or minus to plus. One other, one other note thing that you should have seen, what, what value did you get for the voltage between the dark galvanized and the bright galvanized? What, what, there's no wrong answer, it's whatever's on your piece of paper. What did you observe? What was the voltage? Okay, yes, sir. Um, the voltage was like different, like well, just just for the dark galvanized and the bright galvanized. Like every one, like one So when you tested the dark galvanized against the bright galvanized, what's in that? You got zero. You may not have got exactly zero. Some of you had maybe zero point zero five or some very slow number. Okay, that's because galvanized refers to the fact that the nail was treated with zinc. So we were testing zinc against zinc. Since it's the same metal, there should be no 
chemical or electrical potential and you should have gotten zero. The reason you may not have gotten zero is because we have other metals in our system. We have alligator clips that are plated copper, we have copper leads, and, and the meters weren't carefully calibrated. But that's what you should have gotten. So we can see that by changing the kinds of metals we have, we get different voltages. Okay, so we talked about batteries, and we're going to try to wrap this up because we're moving beyond batteries. The batteries that, that we talked about uh, in our poster over there contained chemicals, and when the battery went dead, what do we, what do we usually do with a battery that runs out? What do we might do with it? Good, and before rechargeable batteries, what did we used to do with it? We would throw them away. Today, hopefully, if they're disposable batteries, that's what we call them, we would try to recycle them. But then we got smart and said, gee, we can have rechargeable batteries. And we recharge them by using the electricity in the wall. Well, there's another kind of, it's like a battery, but it's not quite a battery. Instead of having pairs of metals, it uses hydrogen and oxygen. Does anybody know what this device is called? Okay, it's, a, it's a, a battery that runs on hydrogen is called a fuel cell. And our fuel cell demonstration here requires hydrogen. So we're making our hydrogen right here in, in the school. And we're doing that by providing electricity to split water into its two components, hydrogen and oxygen. And what are we using to generate our electricity? Right, a photovoltaic cell. And since we're not outside, we don't have sunlight, we're using, we're using a lamp today. I'm going to open my, my valves here, and hopefully our, our fuel cell will start. If it doesn't, it should start in a few minutes. We'll see if this is going to work. Uh, well, we'll have to come back to it in a few moments, all right, and see if we can generate electricity from our fuel cell. We'll be back to this in a second. So just briefly, uh, we're pow we have this lamp representing the sun, and we get the electricity through the wall outlet and the wires that run through the building and out to the street and back to the power plant. Does anyone remember how Chuck said that we, we make electricity at a power plant that uses coal, for example? Does anybody remember? He said we need to have a fluid that turns a turbine or a fan. Do you know what the f Okay, but if it's a coal-fired power plant, it's not air that turns the turbine. Anybody know what turns the turbine? Yes, sir. Steam? Yeah, steam. And how do we make steam? We have to provide heat and boil water. Exactly. So we're going to sort of demonstrate that. We talked about different kinds of energy. We have two fundamental kinds are kinetic and potential. Kinetic is the energy of motion. Potential is energy that's waiting to be tapped. Okay? There are different types of uh, potential energy. A battery that's not connected to anything has potential energy. Okay? Chemicals have potential energy. Um, the heat contained in fuels, like fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, gasoline, diesel fuel, that chemical energy is also potential energy. And we're going to convert the potential energy in our fuel into mechanical energy. And the mechanical energy is going to, is going to make a turbine spin. So this is called Hero's engine. Hero was a Greek scientist who lived thousands of years ago. And uh, he realized that if he could find a way to take the spark, okay? That's why we brought matches. All right. Uh, that if he could contain the steam and direct it, he could put it to practical use. And thousands of years later, Newcomen and there we go. And what? invented the steam engine. So we have, we have a soda pop can, and it's been emptied of all the soft drink. 
we've replaced it with just a little bit of water, and we do that in a very special way. There's two pinholes, so all the liquid exits and enters by the pinholes. And if we heat this for about a minute, we're going to get some boiling water, and the boiling water is going to come out of the pinholes. And what do you think will happen when, when the steam comes out of the pinholes? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's going to what? Uh, what? What's going to happen? Anybody else know what's going to happen? Yes. No, it's oh, going to it's, explode. It's not going to explode because it's got pinholes to let the pressure out. Yes. It's going to start to turn. Yes. It's going to start to turn. This isn't as big a flame as I get out of my... Uh, yeah, there's also a spare... A propane torch behind, a uh, spare propane bottle behind me. That square can. Oh, you got it. Okay. Okay. We're getting there. It does take about a minute. Is it steam coming out? We're getting there. I don't know what that is. Yes, the uh, lady on my left. Um, why does it keep, like, the fire? Uh, I must have contaminated, contaminated it with something. So is something on the outside of the can that keeps igniting? That's a great question. And that young lady. Same question. Yeah, that normally doesn't happen in this demonstration. Let's try a different can, Chuck, before I brought extras.
Sure. Well, that's why we need an engineer here. We're scientists. Yeah, we're chemists. Okay. Um, that's great. We're going to come back and see if our fuel cell is going to work. In the meantime, we're going to do another chemistry experiment, and you're going to open your kits, and we're going to make a polymer. Okay? Um, if we had, I think we're running a little short of time today, but if we had time, we would explain that we're making a cross link polymer. So if we were to get up from our chairs and hold hands, we would be, we would be, uh, we would, we would form a polymer. Each one of us is a unit, and polymer means many units, and we would be a polymer. And then if we made a circle and then reached across and grabbed someone from the other side of the circle, we would be a crosslink polymer. So what we're going to do is everyone gets one paper cup, and everyone should have a plastic bag inside your kit. We're going to fill the paper cup with um, a mixture of glue and water that's half part. Oh, okay, before you start, you get to take these home with you, so write your name on the bags so that you know it's yours. And somewhere, I'll show you what it's supposed to look like when we're done, but um, write your name on the bag, and then you're going to take your glue solution and put one cup full of glue into your bag. And then you're going to take the bottle labeled borax. Oh, before you do that, yeah, put your glue in in your bags. And then pick your favorite color from the food coloring, and you can mix it up in your bag and color your, your slime. Does everybody have their name on their bag first? You should have a marker in there. Make sure your name on your bag. Well, yeah. I'm looking at when you go for it. Work okay, guys, make sure your names are on your bags before you start because that's more hard to do it afterwards. Um, yes, put the glue in the bag. We're gonna no, we're gonna fill the cup. Okay. Fill the cup like this. And then we pour. Yeah, put it to the top. And it goes in your bag. And in it goes. And you get the glue. You do the same. As yours. And then when you're ready for your borax solution, after you have your glue and your and your favorite color. You're going to take your measuring spoon and you're going to measure one and a half teaspoons. That's about half the half of this spoonful, and you'll see the scale on the side. So you just pour that in there. Okay. We're gonna do that. Yeah. No, that's for the bowl. Do you have your favorite color in there yet? You can, okay, you're going to use the same color? Uh, yellow too? Yeah. Yeah. Green and red. Or you mix them, yeah, make a new color. Yeah. About three or four drops should be. That's right. Way to find out. Wait, do I know this in a Okay. Yeah, one and a half. Yep, you're going to dump that in your bag. Pour this in here. Now, close up your bag nice and tight. If you have all your ingredients there, close up your bag nice and tight. And then, 
Don't be afraid. Just gently mix up your slime. Just like that. How many drops? Just like that. Half, half, one and a half teaspoons. You're going to pour that one drop. Oh, yeah, one and a half. No, one and a half. No, one and a half. Oh, you wait too much. Yeah, go ahead and you can dump it back into the grass. Where did the example come from? No, one and a half. One and a half. Okay, you go ahead and do count, right? Yeah, you have nobody's added this solution yet. So you all have to add that solution. Okay, now I'm boring. White's my favorite color, but it should look like that when you're all done. Okay. I did just the way you guys and gals are doing it. Close up your close up your bag. Oh, okay. Whoops, a little bit. It's okay. A little bit too much. We'll fix that. Yeah, don't look like it's We call it a few drops. Two, three, four drops. Okay. So here, this is put it in. Okay. Okay. I instead of shaking it, I would suggest kneading it. So if, if you didn't see me before, we're just gonna close this up nice and neat like that, and just gently knead it in your hands like that. Okay. How much do you do? A one to one and a half. Four, actually. Just keep mixing gently. Can I see the colors? 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 Okay, I need to cover up the dye. What color are you trying to make yours? I don't know. We're just I don't know. I'm adding. Oh, okay. Mine's like brown after I add it. Can I do the blue things? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this part's working. Okay. This part's working. Okay, I need the blue. Thank you. Wait, I need the blue. This, this is red and green. Or purple and green. Look, I must not have mixed the line. Hey, it looks like everything's coming along very nicely. If you have an opportunity, you can look over and see the fuel cell operating. You'll see the fan spinning. So we got it working.
Okay, it looks like our slime experiments are coming along very nicely. I appreciate that. Uh, make sure the caps are on all the bottles so we don't spill anything. And you can leave these right here. They'll be waiting for you when you come back because the next thing we're going to do is have Mr. Anderson help us complete our bottle rocket project. So wrap, wrap this up, close everything up nice and neatly, and then uh, we are going to quietly and orderly get up from our seats and follow Mr. Anderson. Hey, be very careful not to hit the cord. All right, we're on the uh, next stage of our making our bottle rockets. Uh, earlier, we uh, cut out our fins with our laser cutter down in our tech room, and we're going to attach the fins to our bottle rocket. Uh, you need a couple supplies for this uh, stage. Of course, you obviously need your bottle, uh, you need your fins, and also you need a uh, glue gun. You can either use the high temp glue guns or low temp glue guns. Uh, basically, well, all you want to do is make sure uh, your fingers are completely out of the way. So everybody, we're going to take the glue gun, you're going to start on the high uh, tip of your fan and work your way down. You're going to give it a couple blows to cool the glue down, and right where we made our lines coming down, you're going to take your fin and you're going to attach it to the bottom. We're going to give it a good solid uh, count to three, blow on it a couple times, and it's going to be attached. Okay, I'll show you how to do this first one. Then uh, I'm going to let everyone uh, go out and start on their own uh, rocket. Very first thing, a little bit of glue up at the top. Just pull on the trigger ever so lightly so the glue comes out. You have a nice bead of glue there. Cool it down a couple times and all you want to do is just gently saw that fin back in place and it's attached on your bottle rocket. And all we're going to do is just work our way around the bottle. Every place uh, where you have a black line is where you're going to attach a fin. Now the most important thing whenever you're doing this is first of all your fingers are out of the way and when you go to set your glue gun down, it already has little legs that it sits on, just make sure it stays like that, nice and careful. There she goes just like that. And this is another reason why I like to use the uh, tougher plastics that come with the uh, bottles that have not been recycled. They can withstand a higher temperature, especially when it comes to glue. And all you gonna just do is simply work your way around. And if yours isn't exactly on the black line that you have drawn, relax, don't worry about it, it's just a guideline. And we're just going to keep working our way around until we have all the fins attached. And we're going to move on to our next step, which is building the dome to our rocket. And we're going to do that with some plastic cups. And that will also help out with our aerodynamics of our rocket, which will allow us to go a couple hundred feet, if not more, into the sky. Okay. 
Any questions, anybody? Anybody? Okay, so the most important thing is be very careful when you're working with the hot glue. I'll be floating around if you need me. Any questions, I'll hear, hear the answer. And when you get them all done, go ahead and set your bottle with the uh, cap facing upwards to the ceiling and let the uh, fins get ni nice and dry. Then we'll move on to our next step. All right? All right, see you later. And keep in mind, the most important thing that you want to do at this time is make sure the nozzle of your bottle is aimed towards your stomach so your fins are going to be glued on the proper way. You can go ahead and keep blowing on yours now that they're already attached. And even though we don't have enough glue guns for everybody, I like how everyone is cooperating and uh, helping each other out. Just gotta pre press down a little harder on this one than on the other ones. And just come around. And just attach right there. Keep going out a couple times. Nice job. We're just working around the room. Make sure when you get yours, fan is going away from you. Okay? Fan is going away from you. Flip yours around, sweetheart. No. Fin's going that way. All right? See how everyone's fin is going? Perfect. Perfect. So, we'll way back here. Put your glue going here. Around and across. Attached. Just keep working right around. Then as soon as you're done, we'll be good to go. You got the glue? Alright. Good job everybody, good job. Everyone's doing a wonderful job. I'm here if you ever need a hand. Excellent. Look at it. That's all right. That's good. good job. Six. 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 How many people are done already? Just go ahead and raise your hand. Make sure that your fins, the bottle's facing you, and you want your fin going in that direction there. Okay. Alright, this one, your line's a little bit off. Let's move, try to move it right about there. Okay? And you're going to do a great job. And as soon as you, you get burned a little bit, it's okay. One of yours, to show you how it's done. You want to make sure your fin, the nozzle is facing you when you attach your fin, and the fin is going away from your body. Go ahead and blow on that one while I get this one right. That's totally up to you. One thing I always like to do, see how the two liter bottles have this yeah. lower ring? I like to attach the fin right there. It just gives me a nice guideline so they're all basically even uh, where they want on the bottom. You can put them high, medium, or low, wherever you want to. Okay. All right? Everyone's doing a great job.
Whenever you can see the back end of the nozzle, just go ahead and stick one new one in. Yes, sweetheart. That's okay. You'll tighten up uh, once you put the water in. Yes, uh, Will it go higher? It depends on the wind outside. It depends on how much water we put into it. Okay, okay. is everyone done with uh, gluing on their fins? Everyone's done. All right, well, for our next treat, we're going to go outside and I have some spray paint, some uh, couple different colors, and we're going to spray paint our bottle rockets. All right, very first thing before we move, is everyone's hot glue gun unplugged? Yes. yes. And if uh, a couple people ask, if their fins aren't exactly straight, relax. Uh, we'll see what's going to happen to them when they go outside. I'm sure they're going to work out fine. At this time, everyone, please push in your chairs and follow me outside. All right, uh, now we're outside, and what we're going to do is just uh, take our bottle rocket and add some color to it by just using a uh, basic can of spray paint. Uh, make sure that you follow the instructions on the back of the spray paint can uh, so no one gets hurt. The most important thing that you can use with this type of paint or any type of paint is make sure you're using it in an area where there's a lot of ventilation or a lot of fresh air, okay? Basically, what we want to do is make sure we shake it up and you want to stand about uh, a couple inches away from your rocket. Just back up, just to make sure it doesn't get on anyone's clothes. And just lightly paint it going around. And if it gets on your fingers, tips, that's all right. Make sure you get all the fins nice. Just adds a little bit of color to it. Also, when you add the color, it helps track it in the sky a little bit better. And then all we're going to do is set it right here and let it dry. So, uh, Sakai, do you want to come and try to do your next one, please? You ever use a can of spray paint before? Yes. All right. Just hold that nozzle, just real nice and light. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Now you're starting to layer it a little bit too much. Pull back a little bit, about six inches, about a foot away. Now I'll try it. 
There you go, perfect. Keep turning. Not bad. Not bad at all. Not bad. That's pretty good. Perfect. Perfect. Not bad. All right, and how about uh, Alexia? Why don't you come over here? And if you get a little bit on your hands, that's okay. Shake it up nice. Let's make sure we have the nozzle cleaned out. Come on, screw up. Jerry, you spray man. <laughs> no, it's not that Jerry use hairspray. You use hairspray, you use spray man. Nice and easy. Now you don't just want to hold it in one spot because that's when it starts to layer. Just constantly moving it. Nice and easy. Got it? Alright, here we go. Perfect job. Keep turning your bottle. As you notice how many people smell those fumes as it's giving off. Those are what can make you pretty sick if you're not using this in a well ventilated area. Those fumes build up and uh, they can make you pretty sick. And we're just going to let this one stay in the sun for about 10-15 minutes and we can launch them. I forgot something that's very very important right now. Who knows what I forgot? Goggles. Goggles. Safety is always first. I don't want anyone to have any injury to their eye. So, um, Emma and uh, Morgret, please go in. You know what? Start to go with them because they're we need 20. Get all the safety goggles from Ms. Master or uh, from the IMC, please. Safety is always first. What? bottles, go fill them up halfway with water. Fill up with water, fill it up with water, fill it up with water. And then come back out here. All right, now we're at the final stage, uh, and probably the most exciting of our bottle rockets. That's the stage where we put them under pressure, and uh, we see how high we can get them up in the sky. Hopefully we can get them higher than 10 feet. All right, now that we're outside, we have to be extremely, extremely safe. So I've supplied everyone with goggles. I want you to put those on until uh, we're completely done, all right, including myself. Now, the next thing I, you notice that I have a simple rocket launch kit. Uh, you can either purchase these or you could build them yourself. For the most part, it's easier just to purchase them. By the time you get each individual part, you spent more than uh, just buying a kit to begin with. You also need a bicycle pump. You try to get a bicycle pump that has a pressure gauge built into so you know exactly how much pressure is going into uh, your bottles. At this time, are there any volunteers that be the first one to set theirs off? Come on up, sweetheart. Now the first thing that you want to do is have your uh, water bottle filled up about a third of the way. We're simply going to have a tube that supplies the air come down. We're going to make sure this is all nice and wet. And then we're going to slide the air tube, which is attached to the bottle, down into the launch tube. And right here, this little pin right here is called a caudal pin. And this is a safety device, which makes everything work very, very well. We're going to uh, put the caudal pin in, and that's more or less our safety to make sure there's no accidental launches, especially when my face is down around here. Because I'm a tough guy, but this thing smacking in me in the face, I might uh, cry a little bit. All right? 
So we're at this stage and we're about ready to go. And the next thing I want everybody to do is stand up. And if you want, form a big circle around. <laughs> All right, uh, we're now to the most exciting part of our launch and our, to our project is uh, when we're getting ready to launch them. Uh, right before blast off, we're going to bring in a lovely and talented Mrs. Lehman. And she's going to help coordinate our blast off. So we're going to go up here to the bicycle pump. We're going to try to put in around 120 pounds of pressure into this bottle. We're going to see what happens and see how high we can go. All right, everybody? Yeah. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> How many pounds we got so far, sweetheart? 60 pound pressure. Do me a favor, come over and hold this down. All right, now I'm gonna release the cotter pin in our rocket launcher, and that's our safety trick. Now, sweetheart, whatever you do, don't pull it, because I might go up in the sky with the rocket, okay? Now remember, when they say blast off, Tug it just nice and easy and it's gonna go up, okay? okay? We how many pounds of pressure tell the people? 80 pounds pressure. What are we up to now? 120 pounds of pressure. Alright, Mrs. Lehman, whenever you're ready. And the countdown begins. Three, Three two, two, one, one let's go! Applause. And we're going to keep doing more. All right, uh, that first rocket launch was a 20 ounce Pepsi bottle. Now we're going to kick it up a little bit with a 2 liter bottle. Same process, we have the tube attached. It's always to get that uh, nozzle a little wet, it just slides a little bit better. Launch, put your caudal pin. Like I said before, this is the most important part of everything because it keeps everybody safe. Get my sunglasses out of the way there. Is everybody ready? Yeah! All right, Mrs. Lehman, you are ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. And as you can hear, and as you can see, you can hear the bottle expanding from us putting air inside that bottle. You can also see the bubbles and that's the air going into the two liter. And if you notice there's a big difference because with the two liters I'm only up to about 40 or 50 pounds of pressure. Alright, I need you crystal over here. Tell everybody what we're up to now. 50 pounds of pressure. What are we up to now? 60 pounds in pressure. All right. Around between 60 and 80 pounds. It's like a brick. It's so it's so uh, been so expanded by the air. We're going to re release our safety pin. We want to make sure the car is out of our way. Don't want any lawsuits here. And we're going to keep putting pressure in. What are we up to, Crystal? 80 degrees in pressure. 80 degrees? I mean, 80 pounds. There you go. We're up to 100. Ooh. Mrs. Lehman, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Children, are you ready? Yeah! All right, Mrs. Lehman. Three, two, Way up in the sky, <laughs> way up in the sky, you guys at home didn't see there was a plane that was flying overhead and I think we scared it out of the sky a little bit. Uh, once, most importantly, once you uh, do these experiments, if you notice our uh, bottles that keep going over the hill, make sure that you clean your bottles up and whatever trash you bring outside 
make sure you put it in the uh, proper containers or take it inside to the trash cans, okay? Next volunteer, Kramer. All right, uh, next we're gonna have uh, Mr. Kramer uh, shoot off his rocket, but we're gonna try something a little bit different. We're gonna remove the cap, and this time I'm gonna have Mr. Kramer put in some thick blades of grass down inside the two liter bottle. This uh, chokes out the bottle a little bit, which gives us more pressure, which should shoot this two liter bottle in the sky a little bit higher. Okay, there you go. Any blades of grass? Any nice, big, thick blades of grass. Just grab a handful. And all you want to do, I see your box. <laughs> you just jam it in there. Jam it in there. Now, hold that piece, put that in your pocket. And once again, we're going to go back to our launcher. We get some slack in our air tube. Bring me over the caudal pin. Once again, the most important part keeps everything nice and safe. Alright, Mr. Kramer, remember don't tug it super hard. Just a nice, easy pull, and she should launch. Take some of the slack out of the line right there. Is everybody ready? Yeah! Everyone have their glasses on? I know I'll take mine on and off, but does everyone have theirs on? Yeah. Yes. Alright, here we go. We're only up to 40 pounds of pressure. And normally when we're, like I said earlier, when we're around 60 to 80, I like to go and release that safety pin. We're at 80 pounds right now, and as strong as I am, there's no way I can make that two liter dent because there's so much air inside of it. Crystal, how many pounds do we have, sweetheart? 80 pounds in pressure. What about now? 120 pounds of pressure. All right, Mrs. Lehman. I'm expecting great results. Are you ready? Three, two, one, let's off! Oh, okay. How many people think it went further because of the grass? Hey, be very careful not to hit the cord.